Okay, thank, thank you, thank you all very much. Um, it's it's also um, my first time here at, at Madigny, um, so the opportunity to introduce um, a speaker is a, is a huge honour. Um, and thank you very much to the to the organisers for letting me to do that. Um, Aidan Hart um, is is not only an iconographer; he, he's an author. He's written um, the two significant books: one book of essays and reflections. Um, one book on practical techniques for icon and wall painting, which sounds a bit um, stodgy, but the introductory part to it, which is considerable, is, is absolutely superb. It's absolutely brilliant, and I recommend both of those. Um, Aidan's also founder and an active teacher on the Diploma in Icon Painting, which he founded for the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. And he has also been the subject, I'm not sure how many people in the room will have come across this in, in I think it was January this year, but um, Aidan was the subject of a, a BBC Radio 4 National Radio Commission, um, which was spread over five days um, on the creation of an icon. Now, when I heard that this was going to be broadcast on radio, I was really rather puzzled as to how this was going to be done. I thought this is really going to be dreadful and, and, and what have you, but it's absolutely the reverse. Um, if anybody hasn't had the chance to hear it yet, I don't know for definite if it's still on the iPlayer on BBC, but please do, if you get a chance to, to listen to it. It's absolutely excellent. Um, Aidan significantly is, is an iconographer, paints um, panel paintings, and is a carver of wood and, and stone as well. So unlike people like me who just research iconography, Aidan actually does it, which is, it gets my full admiration. Um, I wanted to just say one more thing by way of introduction. Um, two weeks ago, exactly today, um, I, was, um, I had the privilege of, of sitting and watching um, an icon painter on Mount Athos um, for a whole day in his icon studios. And whilst he was painting uh, an icon of the Apostle of St. James as part of a broader commission. Um, I was there doing some research, and this was at the end of my, my two weeks that I'd, I'd spent out there. Um, he doesn't consider himself the best iconographer on Mount Athos, and it's a bit like asking a taxi driver who they think the best person of any type is anywhere in the world. You'll get umpteen different answers. Um, but when I spoke to the monks, this name cropped up over and over again, and this particular monk. So at the end of the day, when the Talenton was standing for Vespers, um, I was quickly asking him about what he thought about contemporary iconographers in the world, so um, modern Greek iconographers and, and others, and he told me about that. And I wandered over to my bag, and I saw in there was Aidan's book, um, Beauty, Spirit, Matter, and before I could stop myself, I just said the word Aidan, and he was behind me, and he said, Ah, oh, Aidan, yes, I know Aidan. He's, he's a very good iconographer. How do you know him? And I said, well, in two weeks' time, I'm going to be introducing him at this <laughs> Friends of Mount Athos conference at Maddingley Hall in Cambridge. He said, oh, yes, I know Cambridge as well. So I've been asked to give my greetings specifically to Aidan from one great iconographer, Father Lucas of Zanavontos, to, to Aidan, but also to everybody um, here today. So that's it by way of introduction. I'll now hand over to you, Aidan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be uh, back here again in this wonderful paradisical place. Uh, my subject is painting icons as prayer. Uh, in the past, I've tended to talk about the role of icons from the point of view of those who pray before the icon. But I've been asked today to speak more about the process of icon painting and how this process itself is a form of prayer. And I want to talk about this not really so much to show you how an icon is made, but more to use the making of an icon as a paradigm for how I believe all of us are called to relate to the material world. So the making of an icon is like a microcosm of what you might call spiritual ecology, if you can use that term. So painting icons is prayer. To find God where I am. To me, this is the heart of prayer. And this prayer can be gentle communion, more contemplation than speaking, like Jacob's dream of the ladder, in which he simply beholds and then worships. I'd be pleased to know that this is working. 
or it can also be a struggle with God, as when Jacob wrestles with the angel and will not let him go until the angel blesses him. I've been an iconographer for over 30 years, and um, the act of painting icons has been for me both these forms of prayer. Sometimes it's contemplative, sometimes it's a struggle. The act of painting icons is to pray with paint rather than words. It is to listen and discover as well as to express. It is to offer transform matter in thanksgiving. It's like gardening, to transform the wildness of nature into a garden. In short, the work of iconography is a particular expression of three ministries to which we are all called to be revealed clergy, that is to be prophets, priests, and kings or rulers. Or to put these three types of prayer another way, to hear and speak, the prophetical role, to offer, the priestly role, and to transform, the role of the, 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 uh, the ruler, as it were. I will speak of this last uh, ministry in terms of the artist, craftsman, and the gardener, for reasons I'll explore later. Of course, the main role of icons is to help us to commune with and venerate the holy person's depicted, and so they're often called a door between heaven and earth. But the theme I've been asked to explore today is more to do with the actual process of icon painting as being itself a form of prayer, rather than their use in the liturgy, though I would say that the act of making an icon is actually part of the liturgy, a bit like um, making the wine and breaking the, making the bread, is actually the first stage of the liturgy. Later on they brought in to the church and then transform later. So let's look first at the prophetical role of icon painting. So prayer is communion and it is therefore two way. It is to listen as well as to speak, to see as well as to act. And this is exemplified in the ministry of prophecy. A prophet is one who declares only what they've heard from God, describes only what they have seen from God. That is why a prophet is also called a seer someone who sees. In a few weeks I'll be taking my icon students to Thessaloniki and we'll be looking at this marvellous mosaic here, a uh, fifth century mosaic of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's on the left there and he has this vision of, um, of heaven, then he writes it down. So he's got to see the vision before he can describe it. So all what I'll we'll be talking about prayer, not just to speaking to God, but to listen to God bit like the choir that Father Stephen spoke about last night. It is largely for this reason that the Orthodox Church does not relegate the making of liturgical art to the individual artist's imagination. The iconographer's task is to make images of saints who exist, not to make figments from their fallen imagination, to make images of things that don't exist. So icons do not depict utopias or theories, but reality, real people. So icon painters must live the life of the church and thereby come to know Christ and the saints whom they're called to portray. They need to be seers before makers, hearers before painters. This is graphically illustrated in the narrative in Exodus about the tent of meeting and how it was made. So first of all, God revealed to Moses the pattern for the tent of meeting. He, gave, he even gave measurements to Moses. And this is because the tent of meeting had to reflect heavenly realities. The worship of the Jews on earth had to be some icon reflection of heavenly realities. The tent and all its furnishings were to be an icon or image of divine prototypes. So the overall schema for the temple had to come by divine revelation. Craftspeople were then needed to execute the plan, but they did not originate the plan. As we study the texts about the craftsman Bezalel, who was called by God to construct the temple, we can see how he is a wonderful model for icon painters in the New, in the new Covenant. We read in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze, 
to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craft. So there's a subtlety here. One, it's clear that Moses was the top prophet, as it were, and it was he who received from God the general schema, the design for the tent of meeting. Bezalel also had to be a kind of prophet in that he needed, as it says, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He, of course, needed to possess the skills and the craft to execute the God-given plans for the tent of meeting, but he also needed to be, quote, filled with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, so that he could understand the significance of the plans, and therefore translate these descriptions into wood, metal and cloth. Moses was given the general plan, but Bezalel had to construct the details. And these details had to remain true and distill the essence of the revelation. So we could say that Moses represents the whole tradition of the Orthodox Church, within which the iconographer operates, while Bezalel represents the individual iconographer, who still needs the inspiration of the Spirit and the life within the Church, as well as technical skill, in order to interpret that tradition. Bezalel means a lot to me uh, personally, so if I may, I'll indulge in a little autobiographical detail here since it uh, illustrates something of what, what I want to say about icon painting as prayer. For me, personally, prayer and art have always been intertwined. They've been inseparable in my journey as a Christian. I come from a, an artistic family. My great-great-grandfather was an English painter who emigrated to New Zealand. You may have picked up my twang by now. Um, and he knew Samuel Palmer, um, another artist of the time. Um, and both on my father's side and my mother's side, there have been a lot of artists. So I was very inspired by the story of Bezalel when I first read about him at the age of 15. I'd just become a Christian, and I prayed fervently to the Lord that he might give me something of Bezalel's gifts so that I could serve the Lord artistically in the same way. And I think eventually becoming Orthodox, 10 years later, and an iconographer is an answer to that teenage prayer. And I've even been blessed, like Bezalel, to be able to serve the church in a wide variety of media, like stone, wood, metal, fresco, and uh, mosaic recently, as well as egg tempera. But the journey has been long and convoluted, a sort of wrestling match with my angel. And I'll return to the story of uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel and Jacob's ladder quite a bit in the course of the next few minutes. So a few years within the Baptist communion after my conversion, gave me a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, but of course, little opportunity for art. But this was followed by a bit of time in a high Anglican parish in New Zealand, which uh, was a parish which affirmed the role of the material world in worship. We had incense and so on. After completing a degree in literature, I became a professional sculptor at the age of 21. My aim was always to try to express the spiritual and the material nature of the human person in clay and bronze. In retrospect, I think I was trying to depict saints. I knew nothing of iconography or the Orthodox Church at this time. To this end, I experimented with different degrees of naturalism and abstraction. So one of my first sculptures was this portrait, just naturalistic. So I thought, wherever I end up, I need to understand the human body. So having done that for about two or three years, I then started experimenting with means of emphasising the spiritual nature more. So I experimented with elongation and simplification. After doing that about two years, I began to try to combine those two together. So you can see this is a sort of combination of, of the two. The artistic search was accompanied by an equally fervent desire to pray more deeply. It was a quest that eventually led me to an Orthodox monastery in New Zealand, the country in which I was raised from the age of two. When I saw the icons of the monastery, I immediately realised that this tradition had been doing for almost 2,000 years what I had been trying to do in my sculpture. And all the conclusions that I had reached about how to suggest the spiritual nature of the human person were there in the tradition. Plus, of course, a lot more besides. And the tradition of the Philokalia 
to which the monks introduced me convinced me that I'd found what I call the detailed ordinate survey map of the soul for which I've been serving, searching. I'd sort of had an actress before, but I wanted something much more detailed, and here the folliculia had it. A word kept reoccurring in my conversations with the monks there, transfiguration. That is, Christ and in him and our human nature and the whole material world becoming radiant with divine glory. This I uh, tallied with a formative experience that I'd had ten years earlier and which had led me to becoming a believer in the first place. A man came to our school and spoke about his conversion and as he was speaking I had a vision of a, of a radiant face full of love, warmth and light. No words, just the face full of light. And behind this person were a community of people, a community of presumably the church. The frequent recollection of this face in the community behind kept drawing me ever forward in my quest. It is what directed my sculptural quest and my search for deeper prayer. But here in the icon tradition, or rather what that tradition represented, was the answer. A tradition that depicted Christ and his saints shining with the Holy Spirit in the Kingdom of God. That face I'd seen was the transfigured Christ. So what does all this prophetical aspect of icon painting mean, practically? To see and depict saints. How can mere pigment suggest this inexpressible light and love that I'd seen? How, for example, might an iconographer approach the painting of a festal icon? Now each icon painter has their own approach to this, so I can only describe my own process. The first stage for me in designing and painting an icon of a feast is to study the liturgical texts. And thanks be to God we have His Eminence and Mother Mary who translated many of the texts um, for us. So I study these and underline, you can see underlining is there, um, and also the appointed biblical readings. Word and image go hand in hand in iconography, one interpreting the other, so they're inseparable. Also, I might study contemporary and patristic commentaries on the feast. And then I begin to assemble uh, existing icons of the feast. They can be um, new or old, a contemporary one by Father Zinon, and this is a much earlier illuminated manuscript. I might even look at relief carvings and ivory. So the end of this stage is to find out how past iconographers have expressed um, the spiritual essence of that particular feast. Contrary to popular misconception, there is considerable variety within the icon tradition. Different festival icons emphasise different truths about that sacred event. Just these two you can see the differences. The next stage is to analyse these icons and ascertain how they've interpreted the theology taught in the texts. The aim of this is to gather a toolkit of stylistic devices to use when finally designing the icon. And then there is composition. So there's colour of course, but what's the underlying geometry? A famous one of course is Andrew Rubioff's so-called Trinity icon or the Hospitality of Abraham. Uh, this was inspired, no doubt, by the words of St. Sergius of Ardenes, who said, Contemplating the Holy Trinity, it has overcome the hateful divisions of the world. So Andrew Rubidoff has put the angels within a circle to show the unity within the Trinity. Yet each person of the Trinity are distinct. So there's a triangle to emphasize the distinction of the three persons. But it's open, it's not a closed circle, their love flows out. So one analyzes the icon to find what underlying structure there might be. So that's more of a static thing. What about the flow, the movement? In this icon, the famous awkward icon, there's a movement from the top left through the angel's wing, and this is reinforced by the building behind which also rises up, through the archangel Gabriel's arm, to the mother of God's womb. So a, a good festival icon will, will organise things according to the main spiritual dynamics of the event. So having assembled from the tradition this, as it were, vocabulary um, of techniques one can use, 
you come to the actual design of the icon. This is one I um, made of the uh, nativity. So I constructed it um, as a square surmounted by a hemisphere. So all of the material aspects of creation are within the square. The square represents the material created world, the four corners of the earth, the four elements. Um, whereas the heavenly realm, the angels and the star, were in the upper third within the sphere. But Christ is in the center of the circle. So though a baby, he's also the logos of the universe. He's the sustainer and creator of the universe. He's the hub of the wheel, even as a child. So I created the structure first and then added the detail within that. What motivates the design can be a number of factors. The commissioner may want a particular theological emphasis for this feast, or they could leave it to me. There's also the inverted commas, the audience. Is there a theme that is particularly suited to the commissioning community? or more generally to our times and culture. Given the current importance of ecology, for example, I often try to bring out the orthodox theology of matter and our role, and the role of our spiritual lives in our relation to the rest of the material world. Another thing to consider is the uh, context of the icon. I was recently commissioned to paint an icon of St. Giles, for St. Gabriel's Chapel in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral. And this has Romanesque wall paintings. Not a very good photograph, I'm afraid. So I designed the icon um, inspired by Romanesque, um, particularly Romanesque illuminated manuscripts. Uh, the uh, Bible of um, Barry St. Edmunds, for example. Also, it can be the um, frame one's got to work with them. Uh, I was commissioned to do this fresco, a large fresco for Lancaster University chaplaincy. And rather unusually, it was a landscape orientation. Normally, of course, the transfiguration is vertical, so you have the three disciples down below. And it was curved, so I had to design this to fit that particular place. So after the design uh, comes the actual painting, the gilding and, and, and the painting. So in a sense, the painting is the last stage of a long journey. So I've described this process perhaps as a bit of a mechanical process, but in fact, I experienced this design process as a bit of a struggle, uh, a wrestle with the angel of truth until blessing comes. The great Romanian sculptor, Constantine Brancusi, said that simplicity is complexity resolved. And this process of design is a struggle to distill the essentials from the complexity given by the written sources and then incarnate these in a single icon. So Bezalel had to make a single tenter meeting from the lengthy descriptions given to him by Moses. We come now to the second role of iconography, which is the, the priestly role. A priest is someone who offers thanks on behalf of others. And it's a sort of a mouthpiece, mouthpiece for worshippers to call down the grace of God. So in what ways can we call the act of painting icons as a priestly act? At first, it's important to make clear that an icon is not a sacrament. It always remains wood and pigment. Even though there is a pious tradition of blessing an icon before it's used, this blessing is not essential for the icon to become an icon. We venerate an icon not because it has been transformed by a blessing to become something other than wood and paint, but because the icon bears the name and likeness of the holy person it depicts. But nevertheless, there is a priestly element to icon painting that the icon is a sort of offering. It is an offering of artistically transformed matter as prayer. We don't offer raw wooden pigment, but wooden pigment fashioned into an icon. So the three may dry off the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that takes a bit of labor to produce. You don't sort of pick gold out of the ground normally. Um, frankincense takes a bit of effort to get. So um, iconography is one step on from that. You transform these even into a higher level. Icon painting is a priestly act, not only as offering, but also in the sense that the icon invokes God's presence. 
It is a material declaration that the Lord is present here. It is itself a form of epiclesis. The icon itself, as it were, is calling down the Lord upon this place, declaring this place is a holy place. It is the praying viewer who is transformed rather than the icon itself. The icon painter prays that through the icon, the Lord will come to all those who behold it and pray before it. The Orthodox Church's prayer before painting an icon asks Christ to forgive our sins and the sins of those who venerate these icons and who, standing devoutly before them, give homage to those they represent. Protect them from all evil and instruct them with good counsel. Many of you um, who have been in Orthodox countries or even pious Catholic countries um, would have seen road, roadside shrines like this. There's an icon in there, it's a bit dark, but there's an icon there. Or even in buses or cars. These icons tell us that God is present in this place, that this is a suitable place to worship Him. So icons can act like a church bell calling us to prayer at this very moment. They are an epiclesis upon the present time and upon the present place. I remember the joy of first going to Greece, coming from our rather secular Britain, getting into a taxi from the airport and seeing an icon in the taxi, getting into a bus, and half the bus crosses themselves and they go past a church. It's, I was in heaven. <laughs> I'd like to dwell a little on this theme of finding God in the here and now through a study of a triptych um, that I was commissioned to paint for uh, Shrewsbury School Chapel. The subject matter requested by the chaplain was rather unusual. That was Jacob's dream of the ladder to heaven and Jacob's wrestle with the angel. As I researched for this icon, going through the process I described a few minutes ago, I began to see that these events were all to do with meeting God in a specific place and in the present. And secondly, about union with him, about deification. After his struggle with the angel, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That is, he changes from a heel grabber, the meaning of the word Jacob, to one who struggles with God. That is, he's changed from a name without God to a name mingled with God. For these reasons, I asked the chaplain if we might combine the two icons of Jacob with an icon of the Transfiguration to make a triptych. So I'd like to now talk a bit about these three as by way of illustrating some of my points. So the account of oops, the account of Jacob's dream of the ladder tells us that Jacob came to a certain place and stayed. That is, at the time of the inspired dream, he was still. He wasn't rushing around. He was, we might say, in a hesychastic state. As the account in Genesis tells us, from Genesis chapter 28, taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway or ladder resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. And when Jacob awakes, he declares, Surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. So this place has become for Jacob a holy place, a place of divine presence. And he declares, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He then sets up a pillar. as a pillar, the stone that his head had been lying on while he had the dream, and he pours oil on it. And he calls the place Bethel, meaning God's house. Now, perhaps Jacob didn't realize it, but it is not just a geographical place that has become holy, but more importantly, he himself has become the holy place. He has become God's house. The dream occurred within himself, so he is the holy place. The ladder went into his soul. I was very interested to note those wonderful quotes um, earlier on from the hymns um, that, that, that Elizabeth showed us about the soul, entering the soul and there finding, as it were, the Lord dwelling within. 
So when he awakes and says, how awesome is this place, this is none other than the house of God. It is in fact he himself who has become this awesome place. To become the temple of the Spirit is of course the whole aim of the monastic life, the hesychastic life, the Athenite life, but also ultimately of every Christian, every one of us here. And as some of you all know, after 12 years, I was um, testing the monastic life and six years um, as a hermit on the hills in Shropshire. But my life now, married with children, is the same. I desire union with God in the same way. My obedience is of a different form, but if it's obedience to Christ, it brings the same fruit. As I'll discuss later, a major reason for the particular style of icon paintings is to help turn us to repent and discover the Holy Spirit given to us at chrismation. It is not just what the icon depicts, but how it depicts the subject that the icon tries to awaken to us, awaken to us the Holy Spirit's presence in our hearts and in the world. A very formative book in my early Christian life was a really little book called Sit, Walk, Stand, written by Watchman Nee. And this is based on the book of Ephesians. So St. Paul first talks about the past, how God has raised us up in Christ and has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. At the ascension, this happened. It's a fact. So he said we need to rest in this first. And only then can we walk in the Lord. We can fulfill his commandments only by resting in God first. As St. Paul said, I labour more than all the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. Then finally, then we can stand against the devil, but only after we've learned to sit in what God has done. So the whole Christian life, I think, is becoming what we already are. Through chrismation, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. And as I'll discuss in more detail later, the very way that an icon is painted helps to turn us. Uh, Christianity isn't an ecstasy, it's an ecstasy. The devil is trying to draw us out and distract us. Whereas the icon turns us back in. In the communal, it's not, a, it's not an individualistic thing, it's a communal turning. We meet all through the heart. So Jacob sees and experiences and then offers a material reminder, the pillar. So this is what it is to be an icon painter. It is first to experience the church as a ladder between heaven and earth, as the communion of the saints, and then to affirm this reality in icons. So icons are like the pillar that Jacob set up to remind himself and others that God is present in this place and in the depicted saint. God provides specific places like churches and specific objects of holiness, like icons, not in order to say that everything else is profane, but to help us treat everything in every place as holy and as a temenos, a sacred place. So a holy object like an icon is not a pond, but a spring. As in Ezekiel's vision of a temple, holiness flows out from under the threshold of the altar and gives life wherever it flows. This reminds me of a profound experience I had when I was frescoing Philip and Denise Sherard's chapel at Evia. Um, while Philip was alive, they had this lovely chapel I made, actually made it themselves by hand, out of local stones. Then after Philip died, um, Denise, I think, inherited some money from her mother and, um, and commissioned me to fresco it. Denise wanted to reflect Philip's teaching on the role of the material world in the spiritual life. So we included trees between the standing saints. So it's a tree between the standing saints, and also if there's a particular animal associated with the saint, we would include that. I used branches from local trees, trees outside the chapel, as models for the uh, uh, iconographic trees I was painting inside. I painted them, of course, not naturalistically, but in their transformed, transfigured state as bushes of light presence without being consumed. So this prolonged experience, the church of about three months to fresco, of painting trees within the chapel as paradisical trees, helped me gradually to see and experience the trees outside in the same way. The specific within led to the general. I felt that the borders of paradise were expanding beyond the chapel walls. 
What of the second icon in our triplets, Jacob's wrestling match with the angel? The account in Genesis reads, he took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, that's his family and servants, and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray, your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, meaning, saying, for I've seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his thigh. So Jacob struggles all night with the man and will not let go until he is blessed by him. Eventually, the man blesses Jacob and gives him a new name, Israel, which means he struggles with God and may God prevail. So as I said earlier, Jacob's new name is a mixture of himself and God, while his old name is simply himself, the heel grabber, because he grabbed his brother's heel when he's been born. Jacob is not content just to live in the world amidst other people, to be a heel grabber, if you like, but he wants to live with God. He struggles with God because he wants to be blessed by him, to be united to him. And this is not just a pious wish, it's a need. He will fight for this or die. Though the man will not let Jacob, will not tell Jacob his own name, Jacob knows that he has met God. In fact, he names the place of encounter Peniel, which means face of God, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life is spared. The whole point is that Jacob is not content to know God as a concept, as a distant truth. He wants to know God here and now, in this place, in this moment, and he'll fight for it. And I think this is the essence of prayer, it's, it's to battle with God. And I remember reading some of Father Emilianos's writings, he describes this sort of prayer as, as, a, as a battle. Not against God, but really it's a battle um, within ourselves. So we turn now, finally, to the Transfiguration icon, which is in the middle of this period. There's a difference, as you might have noticed, in this icon. I took the rather bold step of omitting Peter, James and John, so that we viewers take their place. We are the participators in Christ's Transfiguration. Orthodox liturgical texts so often use the word today. Today Christ is transfigured <coughs> at our table. And this is not mere poetic license, but a declaration that divine time, or kiros, spills out from created time, or chronos, and into the present. A divine event in history acts like a sacred place. It exists to make holy what is beyond it. So just as the two images of Jacob are about encounter and communion with God wherever we are, so too is the transfiguration icon. But there is a difference here. With Jacob, God stood above, or in some translations, beside him, and God gave him but a glimpse of interior union. But in Christ after Pentecost, God can dwell within us in a permanent union, not just above and beside, but within. This is why halos are so important with icons. It shows that the Holy Spirit dwells within the saint, radiating out from within. This is an inseparable union of the Logos to our human nature. This is why the fundamental defense for icons is the Incarnation. It is because God, by grace, has become flesh and blood that we can depict him, because he's become visible. Conversely, this is also why we can depict saints, because they are beings of flesh and blood who have become gods by grace. We'll return to Transfiguration a bit later. We talked now about icon painting as thanksgiving, the other role of a priest. To give thanks is to trace the gift back to its giver. Thanksgiving 
puts a face to a gift, it personalizes it. This is why icons never depict creative things in isolation. We don't have an icon of a tree or a mountain by itself. Always it's in the context of the church and through the church and the saints with Christ, the creator of that rock or tree. So I consider the act of creating an icon as a giving a voice to an animate matter from which it is made, a voice of thanksgiving. Saint Leontius of Cyprus affirms, the creation does not venerate God directly by itself, but it is through me that the heavens declare the glory of God. Through me the sun and the moon worship God. Through me the waters and the showers of rain, the dew and all creation venerate God and give him glory. I think creation can praise him, but it can't thank him without us being a mouthpiece. So an icon is a sort of microcosm, for it is made of representatives of all creation. So we have pigments from the mineral kingdom, that's the azurite, which I use for my blue. The wooden panel represents the whole vegetable kingdom. And the egg that binds the pigments together represents the animal kingdom. So through human skill and prayer, these are transformed, these raw materials are transformed into something even more articulate than God prays. Iconographers are therefore like hymnographers, only that we use colour and form instead of musical notes. St. Maximus the Confessor wrote that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is in fact the material world. When received as a revelation of God's love and thanks, and we receive it with thanksgiving, this material world brings knowledge of life. And such a Eucharistic life of thanksgiving would have prepared Adam and Eve, humankind, to partake at the right time of the tree of life, which is Christ himself, deification. Matter, or rather our treatment of matter, was thus intended to be our preparation for deification. Thanksgiving is a preparation for union. And the making of an icon is like an example of um, not only making creation more articulate in the praise of God, but it's bringing it back to God, saying, thank you. You are the source of all these things. God warned us that if, on the other hand, we were to grab this material world for itself, for its pleasure and beauty alone, these are some illuminated manuscripts. I did an exhibition of eight illuminated manuscripts with texts down below. This one had texts down below. Because I wanted to show that sin has no meaning unless we understand what we're created for. So these illuminated manuscripts started with creation, went through paradise, the fall, and right through to the ascension. So if we grab this material world for itself, for its pleasure and beauty alone, then this attitude of thanklessness would bring knowledge of evil. If we use our power and authority to degrade creation rather than make it more articulate in God's praise, then the tree of creation becomes for us knowledge of evil. I think our secularism and our environmental problems today prove that God's warning is true. So this leads us to the third role of the iconographer, and that of all Christians, that is to be rulers and gardeners. So in what ways did God intend us to rule in this world? This is a mosaic in Sicily, from Palermo. God having created um, everything, and then he creates man and breathes life into him. Then, of course, later on, God names the creatures. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read that God blessed Adam and Eve and told them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And in the next chapter, to work Eden and to take care of it. So our task is not only to give thanks to be priests, but also to be rulers and gardeners and labourers, to tend the world and make it into a paradise, to help seeds become plants, if you like. We are priests, but also princes and princesses. Our authority in this world is given to nurture it and to raise it, not to degrade it. We are called to be labouring royalty, to work as well as to rule. We are to rule from within our kingdom, to get dirty, if you like, and not to preside loftily as from a, a distant palace. An icon painting can be regarded as an expression, a miniature, of this calling to be princely gardeners or craftspeople. 
So let's think of um, Eden to be a, a wonderful god part of garden in the midst of a fecund but wild forest. So here we have the whole creation in the middle is a garden which God has planted. So this god part of garden is a synergy of the divine mind with the wild puppy-like energy of the virgin forest that surrounds the garden. Like this garden around us here is a result of God's creation, but also the gardener who designed it. It's a synergy of human and divine life. The garden thus bears the mark of its designer and planter even more clearly than the forest beyond paradise. So the divine garden now places Adam and Eve in this paradise as in a microcosm and charges them to continue his work of gardening. In creating Eden, the Lord has set an example for Adam and Eve and they are to continue in the same vein, but in their own unique way. So when the Lord enjoins them to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, what he's really asking them is to make the whole world into a garden. Their authority of the world is to nurture and develop it, to raise it up, not to pollute and destroy it. It's important to remember this, I think, because in our age where generally we mess it up, we think of ecology as just get your hands, don't touch it, and ruin it, um, which sometimes can be necessary, but really true ecology is to work harmoniously under God's inspiration. And I'm always talking about gardens, I'm not obviously talking just about gardening, I'm talking about our relationship with one another, our relationship with the whole world. Um, this is why it is only after the Lord has made Adam and Eve on the sixth day that he calls his work of creation very good, and not merely good, as on previous days. I don't know about you, but I find forest, and being raised in New Zealand, I've spent a lot of time in wild forests. I do love them, but I find them a bit oppressive after a while. I much prefer those great parks, and near where I live, in Abattenham Park, that mingle nature's fecund power with man's craft, the meadows, lakes and woodlands are married with beautiful architecture where pathways and fields allow you to walk side by side with friends and family. Then forget that the word paradise is a Persian word which means a royal park that was designed for the, the king to enjoy his friends and family. It was a, a furnishing for love and relationship. So this authority of the creation that God has given us can be likened to the mastery the craftspeople and artists have over their materials. We seek to be masters of our materials in order to give them a voice, not to crush them. We want to make the good very good. And to rule, we first need to listen to our subjects, learn the characteristics of each pigment or stone or wood type that we use. For example, like terra verde, the green is very translucent. Um, if you try to create a, an opaque effect with it, it won't work, it will flake off. Other pigments act in very different ways. Each pigment has got its own logos, its own name, its own characteristics. So before I can transfigure that, I need to listen to it. I need to humbly learn its lessons. As with all liturgical life, I think of icons as a little paradise, as a microcosm, and a paradigm where all is in harmony. From this paradise, others can be inspired to spread this harmony further into the wider world. So an icon should transform the way we see the world. As I said earlier, the icon is not a pond, but a spring which flows out. So I'd like to finish now by um, describing a little of the process of the final painting stage of an icon, at least as I experience it. And I particularly want to point out a few ways um, in which, through style, if you like, the form, icons can help transform our vision of the world. The essence of this artistic labour is to nurture and make manifest the inner logoi of the events and the people and the objects that the icon depicts, the essence of them. So that instead of just painting a bush, I paint that bush burning without being consumed. I lived for a total of two years at Avera Monastery under Archimandro Vesalius and over six years as a hermit on the Stipestone Stills in Shropshire. And one thing I learned from Father Vesalius is rather poetic and often enigmatic way of speaking and writing is that it is not just what is said that can transform the hearer, but how it is said. I also had a number of meetings with St. Paisius 
and I found that his humorous and God-inspired words and his wonderfully original images helped um, what he wanted to say into my soul more deeply. So by the particular style and form, I contain to do the same thing as Father Vesalius and St. Paisius and, and others. That is to help to see the world in a different way, to see the world as a burning bush. In a sense, I think paradise is here, and when the Lord opens up our eyes, it becomes paradise for us, because I see not just an oak tree, but I see an oak tree aflame with a logos within. And what I love about the Transfiguration event is that the scriptures say that not only was his face shining, but his garments. His garments were just inanimate matter. But what's interesting is that the word cosmos, the Greek word used to describe what we now call nature, means adornment. So in Christ's garments, as well as his body were transfigured, basically we can think of him in his whole life on earth, gathering together the whole of the cosmos, wrapping it around himself and transfiguring it. So when his garment is transfigured, we can see the whole world beginning its process of returning to its original glory. For the Logos not only, not only created each thing, but that word he spoke, oak, when he created the oak, that word, that Logos, that little Logos, keeps that oak tree in existence and directs it towards the second coming. And these individual words within the created world are not uh, words of isolation as in a dictionary, but gradually realize that each thing in creation, from a mouse to a stone to my wife to anything, that whole range, is actually a hymn of love, a poem of love written by God to myself. That's why within an icon, everything needs to be arranged harmoniously within the frame, which is called a kibitos. Nothing is arbitrarily cut off. This is a microcosm of a stanza of God's poem to us. This is why also icons sometimes use gold lines called a cease. So we see this, it's just a building, but there are gold lines on it. And in Christ's garment, just inanimate matter, but gold lines, and of course, the gold stands for, for God, for the Spirit. So I come to the material world drenched with glory. Matter made tra transparent to the divine. The whole basis of the icon is the incarnation. God is with us. So each icon is an extension of what happened 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land. The icon helps me to find God here, now be it as a family man with children, or as a monk in a cave in Mount Athos. So a, a, a festival icon depicts an event that happened in historical time of Kronos, spilling out into Kiros. God is acting through an event in history and flowing forwards and backwards. So for example, the Pentecost icon shows St. Paul present, even though he wasn't present, he wasn't even a Christian at the time of Pentecost. But that divine Pentecost spills forward and, as it were, bring this Paul into it. So for me, as an icon painter, making an icon is a journey, and it's, as it were, a microcosm of all of our journeys, I think. But it's not a journey away from ourselves, but a journey towards ourselves, back to where we were. And I think this is hesychas, and this is why we often sit on a low stool and bend ground down to make a circle out of our body, so that we return to ourselves. At first, our prayers might be shooting out of us, but really, Pesachasm is addressing the Holy Spirit who dwells within. Pesachasm is to be where we are and to be there with God. T.S. Eliot Eliot wrote in Little Gidding, the last of his four quartets, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Does it remind you of Jacob? He wakes up and he realises God is in this place. He hasn't moved at all. He's just woken up. So this need to turn and find God where we are in part explains the strange perspective systems of an icon. So we can see uh, so this building here, this part, 
is viewed from the front, whereas that part is viewed from the right hand side. So simultaneously that building is viewed from the front and the right at the same time. In other words, it depicts it as it is in God. Or we have here um, a holy table and the lines meet in front, not behind. Where used to be the centre of attention, you know, I'm looking at God, I'm talking to God. Whereas the icon turns that around and says, hey God, God's looking at you. The icon depicts the world seen from God's point of view. If God stopped looking at me, I'll cease to exist. I remember when I was studying literature at university, our lecturer was um, speaking to us about um, Augustinian poets. And he said, oh, I think it was Bodo. This poet said that uh, if God ceased looking at us, we would all disappear. And we all laughed at him. That's the idea. He was quite right. God, we only exist because God continues to look at us. And this is, so you don't have to read it like you're reading something like a book, or that means this, this means this, but it acts on your soul over time. You're turned, you're transformed. In fact, it can be more powerful for um, not being conscious. Hills and mountains also express the spiritual dynamic of the sacred events. So in the resurrection icon, the hills behind are like jaws open. As I said earlier, the image and the text go hand in hand, and the liturgical text talk about the jaws of Hades. Christ does a bit of a trick on Hades. Hades can only eat people, so God becomes a human being, and Hades thinks, oh great, and here's a great now, God with him up. And then he realizes, oh no, I've swallowed God, and he's got to vomit up not only Christ, but all those who have been uh, captured therein. Or here, the central mountain is reaching upwards, stretching upwards. This is because not only was humankind waiting for God, but the whole of creation was yearning for God's coming, because by our foolishness, the whole of the created world suffered mortality that was weighed down. So here, the whole of creation is, is yearning, and there's a wonderful um, text, a wonderful hymn that says, you know, what should we give you? Earth is off in a cave, the made are their gifts, the angels they wonder, we offer you a virgin mother, but earth also offers a cane. Often people will ask why the faces of icons look a bit sad. Well really, this is a fresco I did in my hermitage of uh, St. Cuthbert. Ideally, you're aiming for bright sadness. The saints, of course, are full of joy, but also, even in heaven, they feel compassion for us, they're with us in our suffering. So you won't find any excessive movements or expressions and icons because the saints want to help us find inner quiet, to find that inner treasury of which St. Isaac the Syrian writes so eloquently. Be peaceful within yourself, St. Isaac writes, and heaven and earth will be at peace with you. Be diligent to enter into the treasury that is within you, and you will see the treasury of heaven. For these are one and the same, and with one entry you will behold them both. The ladder of the kingdom is within you, hidden in your soul. Plunge deeply within yourself, away from sin, and there you will find steps by which you will be able to ascend. So when I sit before the white gesso of an icon panel, I'm aware that a journey is about to begin. And I know from experience it's not going to be an easy journey. It's an impossible task really to indicate invisible, ineffable things, but you can just hint at it. You can reflect something of the character of the saints, their gentleness, their love, their compassion. Of course, you've got the whole icon tradition to help you on this, you're not alone, you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, but the icon painting process is not like a photocopier. You're not a photocopier, you're, you're a living being. So that tradition's got to come through you. So to conclude, I'd say that Prayer, both private, if we can use that term, and liturgical, must be at the heart of the icon painter's life. He or she is called to bear witness. For witness is someone who is seen for themselves. The believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and prayer, repentance, and love is the path to that inner sanctuary of which St. Isaac speaks, where we can meet the Spirit. But for an iconographer to see and know this is not enough. For their ministry is also to testify and paint to what they have seen and known. 
The ministry, like a composer of hymns, demands skill and craft to express this knowledge to others, which is why I founded that icon school. You can get, I found the plenty of pious painters around, but without that skill, the icons are being clumsy and don't express the profundity of that experience. And the vision that an iconography is trying to convey is not of pure matter or pure spirit, but of matter imbued with spirit, creation transfigured by its creator, of man become God by grace, because God has become man out of love. And it is a communal vision. It's not just the person of Jesus Christ whom we depict in icons, but his whole family, Moses, Elijah, and all the Old Testament prophets, and angels as well. All the saints of the new covenant and the old. So this rhythm of inner and outer, spirit and matter, mountaintop experience, followed by labor on the plains, is of course common to every one of us. So everything I've described today about the specific challenges facing the iconographer is but a graphic illustration of the calling facing every one of us, be we cleric, monk, or lay, hermit, or married. So may the Lord help each one of us to complete our own pilgrimage. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Agent. That was superb. Um, we have some time for questions and before tea. Um, if anybody would like, we've got the microphone here, which is, um, is ready to go. Um, when I read um, your book, um, Beauty, Spirit, Matter, one of the things that um, struck me was something you said about that the iconographer mustn't just care about what they do, but they must have courage. And I quite liked that. And I thought, that's really quite interesting because it moves away from a sense in which icon painting is a copious thing. We've talked about this before. And it's just a replication of standard templates. It's absolutely not. And I just wondered if you would be able to say anything about that and what you meant specifically about courage. That um, uh, story of the, um, the talents has always interested me because um, those who were given five talents and two and reproduced them um, weren't afraid to take a risk. But the man who just kept his one talent was afraid. So I was afraid that um, you, know, you might you know, be angry with me, so I hid it and gave it back to you. So um, iconography is a bit like that, really. Um, I think to be afraid to do something uh, with the right intention is a sign that we think we're a machine, that, 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 that we're not a, a living human being. So I think even if I try something that didn't work, um, God would prefer that and just being fearful and just copying. Mm -hmm. And having said that, of course, um, there is a copyist tradition to protect parishioners from wild ideas. So I don't want the parish to be at the, the mercy of wild ideas. But there is a balance between copying while you're learning, on the other hand, uh, equating the tradition with copying is not. Thank you. I think we have several questions. Um, gentleman Douglas in the front row. Um, Yes. My own instruction. Um, <laughs> the, the, I would be fascinated to know what you have to address when you do an icon for crucifixion of our Lord. That would be very interesting if you could say something about that. Okay, yes. I think the whole of life, and iconography in particular, is the union of two apparent opposites. So here we have a man nailed to a cross, talked talk to terribly. At the same time, this man is keeping the whole universe in existence. This man is actually keeping in existence the people who are killing him. So an iconographer has got to be true to both these. So on the one hand, he's not hanging defeat him. He's embraced death willingly. He's the only person in the universe who didn't have to die. He chose to die. So he embraced death willingly. So his arms are like that rather than like that. On the other hand, he's got scraggly hair. He's dead. His, his head is down. Um, and his body is a bit slumped. So in everything, you're trying to indicate both hands, divinity and its humanity. And I love the idea that Adam's skull is normally depicted at the bottom. God often means place of the skull, and that's Adam. So already, as in all the feasts, you look forward to the next feast. So already, that's a little hint 
at the resurrection icon, because of course we see Adam raised up. So one thing is sort of overlapping the other. Thank you for an incredible talk, particularly the theology. Could I ask a question? Could you share with us how much latitude you feel you have from the traditional depiction of icons? How much can you not change, perhaps, but how much latitude or movement do you feel you have or you exercise? Yeah, so, so how much latitude does one have? It, it, it's impossible to describe it. Really. I think, in a sense, you've got to live the life of the church. And this, as it were, gets the music of heaven in your soul. So when you do something, just to say you are experimenting with something, um, if it seems to jar with that inner music, you know it's not working. Um, what other people might see an icon you've done, you might be quite happy with, but obviously it hasn't worked. Or might take 20 years. People just aren't, it's not gelling. Um, but I think the first thing is, well, it's obviously just to be saturated with the whole icon tradition. So you know the parameters in the past. It doesn't mean you've got to only do what's been done. So I think it's a combination of knowing the diversity that there is, having that inner music within you through one's liturgical life of prayer and trying to follow Christ, and um, listening to other people's response to it. Thank you so much for such a lovely talk. Um, I'm thinking of modern artists, Salvador Dali, and I'm thinking of two of his paintings, which are entirely idiosyncratic and have no basis in any kind of tradition, and entirely come from his own imagination, but they also come entirely from his faith. Uh, Salvato Mundi, the saviour of the world, and a wonderful depiction of the temptation of Anthony. I don't know if you know those paintings, yes. Um, are they icons? Um, I think there are two aspects to an icon. One is, if it depicts a holy person and has their name on it, in a sense it's an icon. So if it's a photograph of Father Boasius, it's not an icon in a sense, it's not painted. But because it represents him, I can honour him through that, that picture. Um, the other aspect of the icon which I addressed is how it depicts things. So, uh, an icon in its fullest sense should um, depict the spiritual world as it is, rather than as I fantasise about it. So, in a sense, you could say Dali's image of the crucifixion is, is an icon and that it depicts Christ on the cross. On the other hand, you could say that it's not an icon because the stylistic features don't really correlate with the, um, the experience of the church. For one thing, it's hovering in the air, it's not rooted in the ground, and so on. So I think here there's a difference between art, and I think of art at its best as but like the Magi, they were searching. And I think in the artistic world, if there's a genuine search for truth, it can gradually lead toward God. So it's not liturgical art, but it, it's, it, it's a sort of like folk art in the sense that it's moving, it's searching, it's sort of like philosophy, it's searching. It's not theology, but it's philosophy. Of course, you can get art that's going directly away from God, it's just wants to destroy and smash. Um, so someone like Ben Cusey, to me, I just love his work because that was not liturgical. Yeah, he, he's moving toward holiness. Thank you very much, Aidan. You, you talk about Eden as a, a garden amidst a wild but fecund world, which is a lovely image. And yes, of course, we are, we are told Eden is a garden, but According to all our human understanding, the way we convert something into a garden is essentially to limit its fecundity. You know, I mean, who wants beavers in their garden? You know, but forget beavers, I mean, we don't want slugs or moles. So then, thinking about what you were saying later in your talk, I wonder if what the icon teaches us is less that we should be making the world into a garden, but that we look back at the world and realise that it is God's garden. Hmm. Yes, um, in a talk like this, you've got to sort of perhaps overstate one thing to make a point, but you realise things are much richer than that. So I think I mentioned at one point as, as an artist, you've got to listen to your materials. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I suppose garden would be thinking of as being active. I remember once when I was at Aveyron, um, before I went back to my hermitage, I was talking to Father Gabriel, the gardener, 
and I'd asked him about wild herbs and, and things and, um, and you know, how to garden. And um, I was asking a particular question and he said, oh, just listen to the plants, they will tell you what to do. <laughs> so I thought that's lovely. I think um, one's got to be primarily a listener uh, and then act. And then often when we listen, we don't act so much. So as you're saying, um, just, just to enjoy what God has made and we probably will try to control it a bit less. Okay, well, I, I think uh, to thank Aidan once again for an excellent talk. I've all thoroughly enjoyed it, so thank you, Aidan.